Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series. I hope you're all doing well. Um, this is just a series of, of short talks about topics that I think are interesting uh, about life in the universe and astrobiology, and I hope you'll find them interesting as well. So today's talk uh, concerns this question. Does silicon based life exist in the universe? And this is quite a common question in science fiction, but it's also been asked by scientists as well. Could uh, life be made of an entirely exotic chemistry. Now, you and I are made uh, predominantly of carbon, which is why we refer to ourselves as carbon-based life forms. And what that means is that the molecules from which we are constructed, uh, like protein and sugars and DNA, uh, has the carbon atom as its backbone, as its scaffolding, if you like. And that's why we are called carbon-based life forms. And the question is, could other life be made of something uh, entirely different? And I think probably the most famous um, uh, manifestation of this idea was in Star Trek, uh, a famous episode called The Devil in the Dark, where some miners uh, arrive on a moon called Janus 6. Uh, they drill into the moon to get rare minerals, and then they get attacked by this creature. And the Star Trek Enterprise turns up, uh, does some investigations, and discovers uh, that this creature is actually made of silicon. It's a silicon-based life form, and the nodules that the miners have been mining, one of which sits on the mine director's desk, are actually the eggs of this creature. Uh, after a coming together of mines between the enterprise, the miners, uh, and um, the, the horta, which is this creature, uh, everyone lives happily ever after, as these things tend to end. So the question is, is this realistic, or is it just a piece of science fiction fantasy. Could life be made uh, from silicon? One of the uh, versatilities of carbon from which we are made is that it's able to make many different molecules of many different types. Uh, carbon has six electrons. It's got two uh, in, in the middle, if you like, and four on the outside, six in total. You can think very crudely as atoms as a little bit like onions with different layers of electrons. And on the outer layer of carbon are these four electrons. And these four electrons can bind to things like nitrogen and oxygen and phosphorus and sulfur and all the other uh, elements that make up living things like us and form that great diversity of compounds from which we are constructed. So although we are carbon based, of course, it's not the only element from which we are built. It's just that carbon turns out to be a very good scaffold for adding on all these different atoms that we find in the periodic table. So the question is, could it be replaced by something else? Now, one of the ways in which you can look for an element uh, that has ke similar chemical properties is just to move one row down in the periodic table. And if you do that, what you'll find beneath carbon is silicon. And this is why people came up with the idea of the Horta and silicon-based life forms. They didn't just look randomly through the periodic table for another element. There is a reason why people got focused on silicon. And silicon is a little bit like carbon. It's got um, four electrons on the outside that can interact with all sorts of different other atoms, just like carbon, except that silicon has 14 electrons. It's got some extra uh, electron um, uh, shells, if you like, inside the atom that make it a larger atom. So although the outside is a bit like carbon and it behaves in a similar way, it's a bigger atom. And that has a huge consequence for this element because it means that the electrons on the outside are less well held on to the atom because they're further away from the nucleus. They tend to be pulled off more easily. And that can mean that silicon uh, is often much more reactive than carbon. And a good example of this is the gas methane that you may be familiar with, uh, methane marsh gas. And if you ignite methane with a flame in oxygen, it will combust. However, in silicon, the corresponding compound um, silane, SiH4, is instantaneously combustible at room temperature. It spontaneously combusts because it's much more reactive because of that larger silicon atom that makes the SiH4 molecule a lot less stable. And this is the problem with uh, silicon as a basis for building biology. It's much more reactive. Now, some imaginative people have said, well, that's not a problem. Maybe you can just have silicon-based life forms in cold environments, perhaps in a liquid nitrogen ocean or in a frozy, frozen salty water ocean somewhere. You would um, have um, molecules, silicon molecules that would be less reactive at those cold temperatures. And that's certainly one possibility. You can't completely discount that. 
But there is another problem uh, with silicon uh, that causes problems wherever silicon happens to be. And that is that it tends to react with oxygen to form very long invariant chains of uh, silica compounds. So silicon and oxygen atoms alternately, one after the other, form these long chains. And these chains can stick together to form sheets and all sorts of diversities of things called silicates. And to you and I, these silicate compounds are well known. Uh, they are better known as rocks and minerals. In fact, in the history of our planet, four and a half billion year history, there's been a vast diversity of silicon chemistry going on. And the result of all that silicon chemistry is the huge number and wealth of different minerals and rocks that we find on our planet. And that's worth knowing because some people say, well, maybe out there in the universe on some planet where there's lots of silicon chemistry going on, a silicon life form might emerge. But we have to remember that here on the Earth, lots of silicon chemistry has go been going on and there's not a horta in sight. Other people have said, well, maybe uh, silicon based life forms just are rocks and minerals like the Horta. They store information in mineral defects, uh, in small breakages in the crystals, and that allows them to have a similar thing to genetic information. That's an interesting idea, but it's very difficult to see how that information could be reproduced and passed on from one generation to another. It's very difficult to see how one could really have a life form that reproduces and evolves made from rocks and, uh, and minerals. And so the likelihood of um, silicon-based life uh, of that sort seems quite low. Um, having said that, uh, we do know that you can form interesting uh, silicon compounds. Uh, if you reduce the concentrations of oxygen under just the right chemical conditions, you can make interesting uh, long-chained uh, silicon compounds that even look like um, compounds we find in membranes in life on Earth. Uh, you can also make um, compounds that are hybrid systems between silicon and carbon. Maybe life elsewhere is made up of a mixture of silicon and carbon. But at the moment, as far as we know, on certainly on any planets like the Earth, silicon tends to form silicates and not anything interesting that might become uh, a replicating evolving life form. It's also instructive to look at what life on Earth does when it gets hold of silicon. We might ask ourselves the question, um, when you present silicon as an element to living things on the earth, do they start to become silicon-based life forms? Do they incorporate silicon into their structure that might give us some indication that there is a possibility of silicon-based life? And what we observe in life on earth is that it tends to do rock-like things with silicon. So plants, for example, can grow these phytoliths, which are structural support compounds, silica support compounds that allow um, plants to grow up against gravity. Sponges in the oceans uh, form spicules, which are basically structures that give them rigidity and support and hold the structure of the sponge together. In other words, when biology gets hold of silicon, it tends to do rock-like things with it. Now, you could say, that's a tautology because, of course, life on Earth does rock like things with it because it's on Earth. And we we observe silicon turning into rocks and minerals on the Earth. And that's absolutely correct. It doesn't rule out that on some distant planet there isn't some life form with different chemistry that's formed uh, silicon based um, molecules for life. But it is intriguing that when life gets hold of silicon, it tends to do things that look a little bit like rocks. There's another line of evidence as well that might make us question the possibility of silicon based life. When we open meteorites, which are the, uh, if you like to think of it, the congealed material from the early solar system, uh, when we break them open in some of these carbon rich meteorites, we find the backbone um, compounds of the molecules that make up life on Earth. We find amino acids, we find sugars, and we find the nuclear bases that make up DNA. In other words, we find the building blocks of the molecules from which life is made. But when we look at the silicon compounds in these meteorites, what we find are rocks and minerals as we would expect. And what's interesting is that what we do not observe in meteorites are weird and wonderful silicon molecules that might make us think if things had been ever so slightly different, maybe life on Earth would be silicon based. Maybe the raw materials for biology could have been carbon based or silicon based. And it just so happened that life on Earth became carbon based. We don't see that. We see carbon compounds that represent the building blocks of the great diversity of compounds we see in life, 
but with silicon we see minerals and rocks and that's true everywhere if you go to saturn's moon titan you can see complex organic chemistry occurring methane in the atmosphere uh, reacting under irradiation with ultraviolet radiation to form all sorts of complex organic molecules uh, but there's no sight or sound as far as we know of strange silicon based uh, compounds that might give rise to life almost everywhere in the universe where we look we see silicon bound up with oxygen to make silicates and in some rare cases bound up with carbon to make things like carbides but we don't see very very interesting compounds uh, in the natural environment that we think could be the basis of a very complex silicon based life now we shouldn't be close-minded no scientists uh, should discount something as being impossible at least until we have more knowledge maybe out there in the universe is some strange planet where there's very little oxygen and in some pocket uh, silicon atoms have come together to make unusual silicon compounds that have transformed themselves into a replicating silicon molecule maybe out there in some cold liquid nitrogen ocean uh, in some pocket of rocks uh, the silicon atoms have arranged themselves in such a way as to become a replicating silicon based life form uh, until we know more about the chemistry of silicon no one should discount these things but I think all the evidence to date uh, and at least uh, my own prejudice, and I think this would be the prejudice of other, um, other scientists as well, is that the most likely type of material from which to build a replicating, evolving life form uh, is carbon. At least that is the most versatile element for being able to do that sort of thing in the periodic table. Uh, silicon certainly has versatility, but it tends to end up in minerals and rocks and makes it a less likely ingredient or backbone ingredient for constructing the edifice of biology. But let's keep an open mind and let's continue to explore the universe for the possibilities of strange exotic life forms. That's the end of today's uh, talk. Thank you very much for joining me. Bye.